can stand for a moment of silence and a salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, once again, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the uh, meeting this evening. Uh, we will now move on to, it looks like we don't have any uh, anything for the uh, public presentation or anything like that, so uh, we'll move on to board member comments, if there are any this evening. Okay, there being none, we could move on to public comments on the agenda items only. It doesn't appear anybody signed up, so we can... Now I'll move on to uh, potentially the superintendent's report for February. Amanda, you want to put that up there? Yes. Chris, I think I'm just going to stay here. Does that work? All good. All right. Um, I'm here to present the points of pride, uh, tradition, and excellence that we have for the month of February. Uh, Amanda, I need the keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> Technical difficulties, please wait one moment. Flung it over. I didn't read his mind Well, that's part of the job. Mind reading. Good point. Okay. Um, we need a keyboard that works, please. Is it out of range? <laughs> Might be on. So we've got oh, something going here. Okay. Hey, we'll just click like this for next. <laughs> All right, Vanna. <laughs> DNA lab. Okay. <laughs> Students in Jennifer Ortiz's AP biology class have been conducting a DNA fingerprinting lab as part of their molecular biology unit. Using this format of a police investigation, students compare DNA taken from a crime scene with two potential suspects. The Skeleton Race. Highcliffe Elementary students in Nate Buttonfield's classes combine physical education and health into the Skeleton Relay Race. At the start of their physical education class, students raced in to grab bones to then fit the first group to correctly assemble 20 colorful bones into a skeleton was the winner. Westview Science Fair was held for students in all grades who entered this science project into their building's annual science fair. Uh, community volunteers, as well as North Hill School District faculty and students, served as guest judges for the event. And I believe that's going on tonight at uh, yeah, Westview yeah. as well. Yeah. I got to be a judge yesterday for the first time. That was pretty fun. Yeah. Nice. Sure. Good looking wow. kid on the picture here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who would that be? Our research project iBooks were held with Team Hines. Uh, students were using iPads from Project Connect to tackle the grade 8 research project in a whole new way. Students are researching a historic, impactful event and recording an interview with an individual who experienced or was impacted by that event. Each student will have their own section with an exploratory essay featuring narration from their first person interview in a Team Hines iBook that will share these oral stories and these oral histories with others from around the world, which I think is pretty interesting, using the technology to connect and collaborate, just not across classrooms, but uh, across the country and across the world. So that's a pretty neat project that young Mr. Muha is involved in there in the bottom corner. American Sign Language students in Barb Drennan's high school classes wrote conversational stories, translated the words and phrases, and recorded themselves signing multiple roles. Our ASL program is part of our high school's world language program. Again, they're using the iPads as part of the technology to collaborate and communicate across distances, which I think is pretty neat. Our digital pen pal project. Westview fourth graders have paired up with peers at Avonworth Elementary School to become pen pals for the year. The digital nature of our society has allowed our students to go beyond paper letters sent across miles. Students created a digital holiday card and other communications and are now working on a book reviews using iMovies on their iPads to recommend their favorite books to their pen pals. Again, neat opportunity to collaborate and communicate with the iPads. What they do with the iPads is they do a little um, review of the book and then they put it on a QR code so anybody with a device that can scan that book's QR code then sees the student giving them um, a review of the book whether you should read it or not read it. Again, pretty interesting things happening as we begin to expand our technologies here. The Lunar New Year. Highcliffe Elementary second graders celebrated the Lunar New Year. They learned about Chinese traditions, drew Chinese characters, and tasted Chinese delicacies. 
Our STEAM tunnel books, seventh graders are working on a cross-curricular project combining components of their art and family and consumer science classes. Each pair of students are writing a children's book inspired by topics discussed in their English class and on their iPads using the Book Creator app and bringing their digital story to life by designing and creating a tunnel book to the STEAM iMac lab. We celebrated the 100th day here in North Hills, so our elementary students across the district celebrated the 100th day on January 30th with reading, literacy, and math activities all themed around the number 100. Our high school students in Jessica Hoffman's fashion and sewing class created t-shirt quilts as part of their project. Shown here is Kaylin, who showed her North Hills pride by incorporating a variety of red and white along with North Hills t-shirts in her 49 square design. Nice. Our FBLA students are off to the state competition. So congratulations to our high school future business leaders of America students who took top honors at the regional competition and will advance to the state competition in Hershey in April. North Hills Drama Club presented Peter Pan Jr. to a packed house for three straight nights in January. The show featured North Hills talented 7th, 8th, and 9th grade actors, singers, and dancers. Great job to all, and thanks to our community for such a wonderful support of Peter Pan Jr. Congratulations to our student athletes who signed letters of intent to continue their academic and athletic careers at the Division I and Division II level. Ben Walter signed at the Robert Morris University for football. Taylor Buckley will play soccer at Robert Morris. Danielle McNally, soccer at Clarion University. And Marissa Zupan will play soccer at Edinburgh University. Three soccer players getting scholarships to play at the next level. That was nice. Mm -hmm. North Hills High School Students Council and Hands for Service held their third annual 12-hour dance marathon to support the local Make-A-Wish chapter and the Children's Hospital Foundation. The high school's Hilltop Heroes Club is holding Hogwarts on the Hilltop. A free Harry Potter themed event on February 3rd, which is tomorrow, at the high school from 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock. The all ages event is free, but donations are appreciated for CASA, which is an organization that seeks to prevent child abuse in Allegheny County. Senior Monica Snyder is one of only nine students from throughout Western Pennsylvania selected to participate in the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society's inaugural Student of the Year competition. Monica will be raising funds for the organization alongside a North Hills alum superstar during an acoustic Valentine's with Chris Jamison. This will be held on February 12th from 2.30 to 7 at the Jurgles Rhythm Grill in Warrendale. Admission is $15. And that is our points of pride, tradition, and excellence for the month of January. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Manorino. Uh, we will now move on to a presentation by uh, Mr. Peter Vancheri of Hozak Speck Mutual and Wood LLP, who will present the audit report for the fiscal year of the school district ending or <coughs> ended June 30th, 2016. So Peter, it's all yours. Mm -hmm. Nothing's going to be as exciting as that. I'm the sure. audit report, so don't get your hopes up here, but we'll do our best. I'm really tired. So <laughs> you guys always put me on after something <laughs> exciting. So. Uh, but I, what, uh, also with me tonight is Jeff Wollstonecroft. Jeff was the audit manager on the job, uh, so he spent a lot more time here than I did in terms of interacting with your staff and uh, actually going through the books and uh, performing the audit procedures. Uh, but what, what we gave to you tonight is sort of just a one-page summary of some of the points within the audit report that we wanted to touch on some of the points that we thought were a little bit more important uh, as opposed to going through the whole 80-page audit report itself. Uh, so I'm just going to go down through there. If there's any questions as I'm going through, please stop me and we'll, uh, we'll get them answered at that time. Um, but the first report you see in, the, in our financial statements is the independent auditor's report. Uh, the, uh, the opinion on the financial statements is unmodified. Uh, you also notice in the statements there that we performed the audit in accordance with generally accepted auditing standards and generally accepted government auditing standards. The acronyms GAS and GAGAS there, as, as you note <laughs> on the sheet there. Um, the financial statements looking at the balance sheet for your governmental funds. Uh, the school district has a couple of different governmental funds. The general fund, obviously, is the main operating fund of the district. Uh, you also have a capital project fund and some debt service funds. Uh, within the general fund, your fund balance at the end of June 30, 2016 is broken into three different categories, uh, non-spendable, assigned, and unassigned. Uh, the assigned fund balance uh, at the end of the year is approximately $9.8 million. Uh, there's footnotes within the statements that break down what, the, what those funds are assigned for. 
the majority of it is assigned for future increased costs in the PEASERS uh, district contrib uh, contributions for, for that uh, of about $6.9 million. Uh, there's also approximately $2.8 million that's assigned for future other post-employment benefit costs. Uh, the unassigned fund balance at the end of the year is $3,812,000. Uh, that's approximately about 5.2% of your total expenditures, just to put that in perspective as to what your unassigned balance is to your total. Uh, within your capital project funds at the end of the year, there's approximately $4.6 million in there. Uh, and in the debt service funds, a little bit over $2 million of fund balance that's available for use uh, for future debt service costs. Uh, the statement of revenues and expenditures and changes in fund balance for the various funds. Looking at the general fund first, you can see your total revenues, uh, $72,944,000. Uh, your total expenditures, uh, $72,962,000. Uh, you also had some other financing sources of approximately $26,000. That was from the sale of some uh, various capital assets. So your net change in fund balance for the year, meaning your total revenues, less your expenditure for, for the year, were $8,364 uh, higher than your expenditures. So you can see basically for the year, uh, your fund balance didn't change from the two years. It was a small change of $8,300. Uh, within the financial statements, uh, for the general fund, there's schedules in the back on pages 62 to 69 that show the various uh, revenues and expenditures broken into a lot more details. It breaks the revenues down between local sources uh, and what those local sources are. Uh, state sources, and then the expenditures are further broken down by function and object uh, in the back. And it shows your original budget, the adjusted budget, and then it compares that to the actual. Uh, but as you can see on your expenditure side, uh, you were under budget by 1.8%, which is really close to, you know, on a $73 million budget, 1.8%, uh, you know, obviously tells two things. One, your budget's realistic when it's being improved, and you're adhering to those budgeted costs throughout the year. Um, to give you an idea of, of your revenues by source and the percentage, uh, you can see on that sheet there, it shows your local revenues, uh, approximately $55 million. Uh, it's about 75% of your revenues are coming from local sources. Uh, state, 16 million, a little bit under 23%. Uh, your federal sources, under $900,000, or 1.2% of your revenues are coming from federal sources. So as you're well aware, the majority of your funding is coming from local sources to fund your district. Um, on the other side, breaks your expenditures down into uh, the major categories. Uh, instruction, $43 million, which is about 60% of your total expenditures. Uh, support services, which includes uh, administration, guidance, uh, computer support technology, those different types of items within that, within that category, uh, 27%. Uh, then the next category is debt service, is 11% of your uh, total expenditures is spent on debt service. Uh, as I said, you also have a capital project fund uh, that you're using, you know, that's been funded over the years by contributions from the general fund into there or transfers into there. Uh, in 15, 16, the total expenditures out of that fund were just a little bit over $3 million. Uh, the majority of that was the balance paid to, for the middle school air conditioning project, uh, some of the floors, some technology improvements. Uh, and some minor renovations to Westview Elementary. So, so various different projects that the district uh, undertook during the 15-16 school year. Uh, also, you also have a food service fund. Uh, you know, that's the uh, fund that's operated to provide student and adult lunches and breakfasts throughout the year. Uh, within that fund, uh, the total net change in net position for 2016 was $212,000 that's reported in the financial statement. Uh, now one note in there, uh, which we'll talk about next in regards to the pension footnote, there's an adjustment in that food service fund for the change in the pension liability. Uh, so without that pension liability change, uh, the, the real change in that position for the year is about $150,000, which is good. So that means that your food service funds operations, operating revenues are meeting your direct operating costs uh, throughout the year. So uh, that's, you know, you, we don't see that in a lot of districts. Uh, so that means your, your food service fund is being operated, uh, you know, in a, in a good manner and, and fiscally sound. That's sort of the, the pieces within the financial statements that we wanted to talk about. Uh, obviously, there's footnotes that detail a number of items within the financial statements. A couple items in here just to point out. I know last year we talked about uh, the PEASERS liability and the net pension liability and how we changed, how there was a change in the reporting of that liability in government financial statements. Uh, 
starting in 1415. Uh, with that change, uh, resulted in showing the net pension liability uh, of each entity in your financial statements. Uh, so everybody knows there's the piece has a net pension liability. We report a portion of your share of that portion of that liability within your financial <coughs> statements. Just to give you, uh, to show what that liability is, at the end of June 30, 2016, your share of that net pension liability was $110 million. Peter, when you say our share, the school district's share of a much larger state balance, is right, that correct? Right. Liability, if you right. will. Yeah, the, okay. the, the plan is a cost-sharing pension plan. Okay. So all the members that are in that plan are sharing in the cost of the total liability. And the way the calculation is made is based upon a percentage of your covered payroll to the total covered payroll of all the members in the plan. Right. So your percentage is noted in the financial statements and... Um, it's a, it's a, I mean, it's a small percentage because there's, you know, such a large, right. uh, large number. Your percentage is 0.2548% of the total liability, okay, right. of a covered payroll. So the total piecer's liability, just to give you a perspective, is Please. $43 billion. Okay. Mm. <coughs> now, okay. Uh, how, when do we, the $110 million, uh, can, and I know we don't have enough time here to go, that liability is for, people who are, are now retired and who will retire in the system. Is that correct? Correct. So right. this liability could be stretched out for at least the next 30 years. Yeah, it's just the liability that they're calculating mm -hmm. at this time based upon what the total assets are in the plan as of 6 15 because they're a year behind in terms mm -hmm. of calculating that, mm -hmm. Le less what the total estimated liabilities are of people in the plan. And people that are moving forward. So, I mean, you're funding that liability with your contributions each month under your required contributions. And that's how that liability is being funded. And all the districts are funding it in that same manner. So, you're paying your annual required contribution uh, each month, you know, in each quarter as you're required. And the employees are paying their share. And that's how it's being funded. So, you can't put, pay more, you can't pay less. You know, you're paying what, they're re what you're required to pay. And I'm not sure you, you have the answer, so if you know, it's fine. But how, what constituted us going from 98 million to 110 million in one year? Well, the total liability went from um, 39.5 billion to 43 billion. So the total liability went up nine, not low, almost 10 percent. And so they just tacked on 10 percent, basically, to our number. And, yeah, and your liability went up a little higher, just because the, your percentage of covered payroll may be changed compared to all the other members in the plan. When you look at, you know, how many members are in the plan, there's 500 school districts, there's charter schools in the plan, yeah. uh, and there's other, other members in that plan. So that's how that's calculated. So it just, doesn't... Yeah, just to keep that in perspective, and I'm not sure I'm comparing apples, I think I am, but when you look at our budget over the last five, ten years, we've averaged about 2% increase per year, maybe, Maybe in not even that in expenditures, not probably even less. That. Le much less? Right. Okay. But my point is, but Peasers and the way they're doing things decides that they're going to throw a 10% increase on us in that expenditure in one year of liability. Well, they didn't decide that. That's how the calculation came uh, out. I know, but whoever, <laughs> uh, right, I'm sorry, I didn't decide. I mean, it, that's, that's what's so, it's just, I mean, to me, the way this thing is headed, and, and most, most folks who probably, and I would be one of them too if I wasn't involved here, don't pay attention. I mean, this is, uh, this is unconscionable. This is, this is approaching like the same impact of our national debt. Like it's gotten to a point where it's, it's almost laughable. It's a big number, obviously. And you, yeah. as you're well aware, your percentage is, what are you paying now this year? 30.3% 30, 30 your annual, your required contribution. So and you can see where it was 15 years ago. Mm -hmm compared to where it is now. And you know that, that was one of the purposes of the GASB issuing the statement to sort of put this on paper to so everybody could sort of see what the real liability is for these pension plans. Mm -hmm. uh, not just for cost sharing plans, but for any kind of defined benefit fit plan in, 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 in a government. I mean, to me, this number, I mean, it's just totally irresponsible. I, I don't know, I, I think I'm putting it lightly, but anyway, I'm sorry. I didn't mean no, to that's okay. That. No, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's <laughs> I, when we talk about this at every board meeting, you know, it's, it's, obviously when you see those numbers, or they are startling when you see it on paper. Mm -hmm. If I've done my math correctly, it's something like one and a half times our operating budget oh, yeah. for the year. Yeah, your budget's oh, yeah. a little bit under 75 million, yeah. so yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah, when you look at the next item, what we talk about is your, your debt that you've issued mm -hmm. over time for your buildings and for your construction projects. Your amount outstanding at the end of the year is, uh, in bonds is $62 million and notes is $10 million. Uh, so Which is oh, going the other way. It's coming down. Right, it's coming so, down, yes, yes. Uh, so you can see you retired in bonds $4.6 million in principal in fifteen sixteen and two hundred fifty eight thousand dollars in notes in fifteen sixteen. Um, a couple other items: derivatives. You still have a couple of derivatives uh, in financial instruments. They're disclosed in the financial statements and talks about the market value of those. Uh, Post employment benefits. Just real quickly on that, there'll be another Gasby statement that's coming out that's going to report your liability of post employment benefits. Very similar to how we're reporting pension liabilities. Uh, that'll take effect, I believe, in six thirty eighteen financial statement. So for any benefits that you're providing employees after retirement for health, you know, life, vision, or any other type of those types of benefits, there'll be a calculation made as to what your li uh, net o OPEB liability will be. Um, the last section in the audit report is the single audit section. Uh, that's required because the district does expend over $750,000 in federal funds. Uh, basically what you'll see in the summary of audit results is that uh, we noted no material weaknesses there was no significant deficiencies noted in internal control over the financial statements or over the fund or the or over the federal programs uh, and there was no material instances of non-compliance uh, noted on the major program that we tested uh, the major program we selected this year uh, was the nutrition cluster the school lunch and breakfast program uh, and the donated commodity so that was the program that we tested this year and as i said there was no findings or material weaknesses over the operation of that program uh, so that's sort of a quick summary. Hopefully it was somewhat informative. Uh, you know, the report is, you know, obviously great, a lot of detail in there. Uh, if there's ever any questions, uh, please get, reach back out to myself or to Jeff, uh, and we'll be more than glad to answer those. Um, great. So. great report. Thank you, Peter. Any questions for Peter? No? Okay. Thank you, thank you again. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, you. thank you. And I'd like to uh, thank Dave and his staff for, uh, for the consideration they show us during the audit and also thank the board for allowing us to work for uh, North Hill School District. We appreciate the opportunity and look forward to continuing uh, uh, the uh, ability to serve the district. Thank you. Thank you again. <clears throat> okay. Uh, we are now going to move on to education and Mrs. Bender. I always like to see Dr. Taylor walking up. Uh, guess what? He has a presentation for us, and that is the first item on our um, agenda, which is the curriculum revisions. Dr. Taylor? Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. I'm pleased tonight to present our curriculum revisions and updates. Um, tonight, I'd like to first start off by just sharing with the, oh, fixing the mic first sharing with the public that we have a six-year curriculum cycle at North Hills. And what that means is each department or subject area um, has certain responsibilities and tasks they do over a six-year time period. In year one, we have a needs assessment, and the department under the leadership of the curriculum leader or that department leader, what they do is they go through and figure out what are all the important needs that subject area needs and they research it, and they research it, and they research it, put a lot of time and effort into these very comprehensive reports. It's almost like going back to graduate school and putting together like a 100-page paper. They're that uh, you know, comprehensive. And then based on that needs assessment, they present that to our district's curriculum council, which is made up of um, half teachers and half administrators. And then the following year, in year two, they present a proposal for changes that they're recommending based on the research they did in the prior year. So tonight, we're very fortunate to have a number of our curriculum leaders who are actually in year two on curriculum proposal, and they're going to share with us what their recommendations for some changes in the curriculum are. We have with us tonight uh, our K-6 science curriculum leader, Lisa Goodworth, 7-12 English, Peggy Burns, 7-12 business computers and information technology, Amy Patsalevis, and we don't have a curriculum leader for elementary computer literacy, so I'm going to jump in and talk about that. Okay. So we will start off with Lisa. Me. Not as tall as Jeff. Um, I'm Lisa Goodworth. I'm the elementary science curriculum leader. Um, and as Jeff mentioned, we just finished our needs assessment last year in the 2015-16 school year. And we're in curriculum proposal year. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, those two things and what we came up with over those two years. Um, 
This is like the most watered down version of what you said of a 100 page needs assessment. So if you have questions, you can stop me here at any time. Um, but a couple of the highlights of things we came up with um, is that we felt really good about where we were in science and we had the data to support that. So our five year district average, including last year, um, in elementary students are scoring 93% advanced or, profici or proficient on the fourth grade science PSSA. Um, we also interview or surveyed teachers, surveyed parents, and it's not up there, but one of the things that teachers said is of the... Ed, pull the mic down. Oh, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Um, of 100% 100, 100 of the teachers that we surveyed, and we sent the survey to everyone, felt that um, students had a positive attitude about science and were learning and growing in science. We felt that was important too. Um, we did a lot of research on what is best practice in science, and while we like the program that we're using, students are using um, FOSS modules, which are, stands for Full Option Science System, in which they're doing um, hands-on, minds-on investigations. We're comfortable with that, but we want to include more STEM experiences, um, and specifically engineering experiences. Lastly, we are doing well preparing students for the current Pennsylvania State Standards, but we're, we will be issued new Pennsylvania State Standards, and unfortunately, we don't know what those are going to look like. So um, we did work with the provider of our materials asset. They're also professional development specialists and friends with people who work at a state level. Um, and what they're telling us is look at the next generation science standards. So those are national standards and our best indicator of what the PA science standards may start to look like in the next couple of years. Um, so the difference for us, we're covering already physical life and earth and space science, but that last one, um, we, we feel that there's a little bit of a gap there regarding engineering technology and applications of science when you're looking at the core ideas. And if you're looking at science practices, students are asking questions, developing and using models through notebooking, they're collecting data, carrying out investigations, but are we really allowing them to take those questions and then define their own problems, and are we allowing them to design their solutions? And those two things speak specifically to the engineering design process. So we're sort of looking at how can we take care of those couple things. Um, my team of teachers and I came up with this graphic to sort of guide us throughout last year and this year. Um, as we work towards full STEM immersion where all the subjects um, are combining to work on project-based learning that include all of those experiences, what are some of the things that the science department can take care of? Um, and at the very base level, we said, let's take what we already have and through curriculum writing, can we have teachers take lessons and focus them specifically on using the engineering design process? So we have um, really good modules that we work with that sort of lend themselves to that. So at the very least, that's something we can do right now. Um, and then over the next two years, being this upcoming school year, we're going to take a look at FOST um, Next Generation. So we're working out of second edition modules now, and we sat down and looked at the next generation modules side by side with what we had and said, which, which of our modules can we switch to next gen to sort of improve that there? And then in the subsequent school year, we're talking about adding engineering as elementary. These are mini units, and I'll talk um, in another slide in a little bit more detail. They're two-week units, about 11 lessons, that sort of tack on to the current modules that we have and extend the science content into the engineering design field. So first, next generation. And again, I try to fit this all on one slide here. This is the most watered down possible um, explanation of what we did. So currently we're working out of um, the first column, these FOSS modules, and we wanted to look at updating those modules to next gen materials. So at the time when we were using these second edition modules and we chose these things for our district, there were 30 available science titles and they were listed in bands. So like you could look at a grade three, four band and sort of decide where you wanted to put it. The next gen materials have gone from 30 titles to 18 titles. So they've condensed them and they've given us an order in which we should be teaching them. Like teach these at first grade and second grade and so on. So we sat with a team of teachers, um, professional development experts and at asset and every single PA state standard, next gen standard and lesson objective that we currently have and that we're looking at and sort of sat side by side and said, which of these things can we make changes toward like which of these are better for us and which of these aren't going to be a good fit for us. Um, and understand this is a little bit of a puzzle. So like if you move one piece, then the next piece and so on and so on. So um, it was a little bit difficult to figure out. So I'll just give you an example in fourth grade. Um, fourth grade had earth materials, fifth grade had landforms. Well, the new module is called soils, rocks, and landforms. So those things have combined. And if you give them to fourth grade, then we have a hole in fifth grade and so on and so on. Um, 
So the things that are not highlighted are not changing. Those will be the same second edition modules and asset will continue to stock those for us. Um, and the things that are highlighted are the ones that we're going to make the change. So if you look at first grade, um, I'll start with solids and liquids. That one's easy. We're getting solids and liquids again, just the next generation um, edition. And again, I simplified the rationale so much, but um, what the teachers thought was really important in that was the addition of field studies. So there's three different investigations in which kids actually go out and collect data outdoors. Um, probably the biggest change overall is between first and fourth. Um, we used to teach physics of sound in fourth grade and the next gen standards, that's a first grade objective to understand um, light waves, sound waves. So we moved sound and light down to first grade in place of pebble, sand, and silt. Um, and the reason for that there was listed, the next generation science standards tell us to do that, and it's list, written now to be a first grade module. Um, in second grade, there is no change, um, although you'll see that we did add an engineering unit for them, and they still will do that very base level of updating their lessons to accommodate the engineering design process. Um, in third grade, we moved from water to water and climate, the next generation edition, again, again because of the addition of field studies. Um, and also, we felt it was important in third to introduce them to non-living factors of ecosystems because of follow-up field trips that they'll take as part of the fourth and sixth grade curriculum when they go to Lutherland for their field experience. Um, fourth grade has the most change, as you can see there. We're moving from structures of life to the structures of life next generation edition. Um, again, because of field studies, but also there's um, more content in the new structures of life than what we were covering currently. Um, physics of sound, because we gave that to first. We're picking up earth and sun for fourth grade, and this is really a big deal for us because we've always sort of had this standards gap here where we're rushing to squeeze it in and prepare before the fourth grade science PSSA. So that's always been missing, and it's been nice to be able to fit that right in. Um, and earth materials, like I mentioned, is going to soils, rocks, and landforms. We were covering landforms in fifth grade, but it is PSSA tested content, so now it will go back down to fourth so that they have that material in preparation for the test. Um, in fifth grade, because they lost landforms, we're giving them mixtures and solutions, and that replaces some of the um, investigations that we lost when they gave That's it to fourth grade, one being like an evaporation test. Um, and fifth grade's also switching their environments to environments next generation. This will also switch the order for them for how they complete their investigations because they go outside quite a lot now in the new environments, and we're going to bump it to the spring. Um, and I just noted there at the bottom, these are just our core modules. We have an environment and ecology mini unit in each grade level, and those will still remain intact. Um, in year two, the second year, so not this upcoming school year, but the following school year is when we'd add our engineering as elementary mini units. Um, the format is the same. They're offered first grade through fifth grade, and they all follow that same lesson format in which the first one, the first lesson is an engineering story. So the kids are read a storybook, and it's set um, in a different geographical setting than where we live, and it presents a culturally specific problem. So there's a social studies connection and a literacy connection there. Um, and then the problem that's introduced in the engineering story is what the students are going to go ahead and design a solution for using the engineering design process. Um, so in lesson two, and we felt like this was a really important part as well, they're going to get a broader view of what that particular engineering field is. So if you look down here at the bottom, we tried to be sort of equitable and pick different engineering fields, but you know, if the students are studying you know, what, what does a biotechnical engineer do, then you learn about that particular field. So there's also exposure to a career field there in lesson two. Um, in lesson three, that's where they're collecting the scientific data that they'll then use in lesson four, which is the en engineering design challenge. Um, and we teach the students using the graphic organizer of the engineering design process about how to create something that, that solves your problem and then continue to modify and test your solution. Um, so in first grade, we chose a work in process. It's about improving a Play-Doh process, and it will connect to their um, solids and liquids module. In second grade, they chose the best of bugs. That's designing hand pollinators. Um, there's a connection to first grade's insects module, but also to second grade, which teaches um, new plants. In third grade, they chose water, water everywhere, where they'll design water filters for cleaning water, um, and that connects to their unit called water. Um, fourth grade is a stick in the mud evaluating a landscape, which is a geotechnical engineering unit, and this connects to their soils, rocks, and landforms. Um, in fifth grade, we'll be solving the problem of cleaning an oil spill, and this connects to their environments unit. Um, I didn't forget about kindergarten, <laughs> just that engineering is elementary is first through fifth grade. Um, we tried to choose something for kindergarten that would do sort of both 
things, both jobs? Could we update our core modules and cover the engineering topics at the same time? So currently kindergarten works on, in trees and animals two by two. They are FOSS modules, but they're at the very base level. There's not quite as, um, quite as in-depth as maybe the first or second grade modules are, where students aren't doing quite as many um, design things on their own. So we wanted to give them something a little meatier, and we had to look outside of what we're, we've been using, which is FOSS, at um, the Carolina Biological Sciences has a unit called Push, Pull, Go. Um, it is a full module, so it is a 12-week unit, and um, it does incorporate some of the engineering design type activities while still covering science content at the same time. So we're not quite sure how this will fit into the kindergarten school year, which means next school year we'll run it as a pilot and see how can we make this work for them because we're adding a full 12-week module. Um, and then in year two, when the rest of us are adding engineering as elementary in, they'll work um, hopefully on full implementation of Push, Pull, Go. Um, it is inquiry-based and hands-on, just like the FOSS modules, but it allows them to exercise and more exercise more science process skills, enhance their vocabulary development, um, and participate more deeply in science notebooking experiences. They're doing those things now, but you know we've seen kindergarten become more academic in other subject areas, and it's following suit here in science as well. Um, and lastly, like I mentioned, it does the important job of engaging them in the engineering design process. And they were missing content about force and motion. So hopefully this is like a one size fits all and this is gonna fit in for us for kindergarten. Um, in sixth grade you might have noticed, I don't know if I had it on there, I just didn't show a change. Um, the sixth grade team was there and present looking at all these materials as well. But sixth grade already uses a middle school module um, as part of their core modules which we're still comfortable with and we actually worked in needs assessment year with um, middle school and high school teachers to make sure we're covering all of the content. Um, and also they work on a unit called Models and Designs, which is engineering design unit. So that's it. Do you have any questions for me? I think you covered it pretty well, Lisa. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for having Great me. Great presentation. Thank you. Peggy? Hello. My name is Peggy Burns, and I am... A little bit taller, so excuse me. <laughs> um, I'm the curriculum leader for English and Speech in grades 7 through 12. I'm also a parent in the district. I have two daughters who go to McIntyre. Oh, good. But I'm here to talk about the English department. Okay, so um, again, in the long-term perspective, what we're doing here tonight is we're presenting changes that we typically propose major changes um, once every six years when we're on this cycle. However, given the major changes um, that the state has issued in terms of the state standards, in terms of the state um, reading and writing tests, we have had to make adjustments every year pretty much for the past five years in the English department, um, all driven by these major changes, um, starting with the Pennsylvania core standards were adopted in 2013, and that drove major changes um, in our state reading and writing tests. Um, for example, what was the PSSA reading and writing test given in 11th grade for many, many, many years, um, changed in 2013 to the Keystone Literature Test, um, then now given to 10th grade students. So around that time in 2013, we did have to make a few curricular adjustments looking at, because the test has changed in that the readings that are featured on the test are a lot more challenging and rigorous. The questions, of course, that are asked on the test are at a higher thinking level. So we had to make adjustments in what we read um, and that we looked at and we assessed the Lexile levels, the level of complexity and, and everything we read. Um, and we made some changes accordingly. So for example, we moved some books that we used to read in 12th grade down to the 10th grade level. We've had to change a lot of our classroom assessments based on modeling them after questions that students will see. Um, on the Keystone Literature Test. And by the same token, we've had to make a lot of changes in seventh and eighth grade since their assessment was changed significantly um, just two years ago in 2015. So again, what used to be two separate tests, a reading and a writing test in seventh and eighth grade now has been combined 
to the um, PSSA ELA test. And again, we've had to make adjustments in terms of curriculum, in terms of um, practice every day in the classroom to prepare for these exams. And then finally, the other major test that we prepare our students for, the SAT, that changed dramatically just that this past spring. So we did work this summer um, on adjusting, especially our SAT prep courses. We have three of them in the department. Um, so we had to adjust since they changed not only the format of the test, the way questions are asked, even content on the test. So we had to make those adjustments just this past summer um, based on those changes. Okay, and then last year again, we did a comprehensive self-study of the English department. And basically, um, I just boiled it down to what we identified as what we feel are our two greatest strengths in the English department. And then a couple of areas that we identified that could be improved. So given everything that I just said about adjusting to the major changes in the standards and the state exams, we think we've done a good job in preparing our students for these tests. And again, that's supported by the test data as well. Um, we also think we do a good job not only preparing students, of course, for these standardized tests, but we offer them a wide variety um, of electives to take. And we can kind of group our electives in three different categories. We have a number of electives that deal with publication and writing, like creative writing, like journalism, like yearbook. Um, again, as I had mentioned, we have three electives specifically to prepare students to take the SAT and the ACT exam. And then we also have a handful of electives that cover those students interested in speech and theater, which we are expanding that I'll get to in just a minute. And then we identified three areas that we think we could, we could improve. So one is um, the new core standards do recommend that we make a concerted effort to teach more nonfiction. And of course, in most English classes, we are very heavy on literature and fiction. Um, so again, we've studied for the past few years um, to try to get more of a balance with, with nonfiction selections that we teach, but especially we think we could use more contemporary and modern nonfiction selections. So that was an area that we were looking to improve. The other thing is, um, given how we are using more one-to-one -one devices, we were looking for some better online resources. What we had been using for many years um, are the online resources that came with our whole textbook. Now, the, these textbooks we've been using for about 10 years, and the online resources that came with them were really good 10 years ago um, when we got them with the textbook. So what I mean is, we had the textbook itself is available online. There are audio selections so students can download and listen and read along as they're reading at home. There are introductory videos for our reading selections that are kind of like movie trailers to get the students interested. Um, there are some presentations on literary concepts. So again, these were all good but they look like videos that were made 10 years ago now. So um, we were looking to see what else was out there that might um, be a better fit. <coughs> and then finally, one other area that we were looking to improve, um, as our class size now is about 24 students, it is becoming increasingly a challenge to be able to individually address different students' writing needs. So we were looking to see if we can get some type of, of help in that way, as there are so many resources online now, we were looking to explore what was out there um, to help individualize student writing instruction. And so, um, given the weaknesses we were looking to address, the most obvious option um, that we found to meet these needs um, was a program that was being used in our sixth grade classes called Study Sync. So the sixth grade classes, or some sixth grade classes, piloted this program last year. Now all sixth grade um, classes are using it, my daughter included. Um, so we decided to pilot this program this year in a seventh, in an eighth, in a ninth, and in a now a 10th grade class. They are piloting this program. So 
After the pilot, we did decide that this program does in fact meet some of the needs that we identified that we wanted to improve specifically. Um, it does feature a lot of more contemporary and modern non-fiction selections. Um, we really like the assessments that come with this program that are very good practice for the standardized reading and writing tests that our students will take. Um, and the other thing is it really does maximize the one-to-one -one devices that our students have in the middle school that will eventually be um, rolled out to the upper grades as well. And again, all of those things that are kind of like bells and whistles that I had mentioned that came with our old textbook, they really are better and more modern, as I said, like the kind of the movie trailer introductions to the literature that we read. So we liked all of those features, so that is what we're asking for to be used in all of our seventh and eighth grade classes, to be used in our English 9 class, our English 9 lab class, and our English 10 lab classes are looking to implement um, study sync. And then just one last thing that we're looking to change um, is just to expand some of our theater arts courses. So we've always had a handful of theater classes, um, but one in particular that we're kind of trying to branch out is we've always had a class, or at least for a long time, we've had a class called Acting and Stage. And we're kind of looking to separate those two fields and have just a separate acting class and a separate stage production class. And the stage production class will actually now um, be under the direction of the art department to study, you know, actually building the sets for productions and things like that. Um, and then we really want to go more in depth with acting instruction. So we're looking to have separate levels of acting, acting one, two, three, four, to kind of be modeled like our journalism classes where we have separate levels of that, same with yearbook. Um, because those classes are specifically geared to the production of our student publication. So it's advantageous to be able to have students take that for multiple years because it would be the students who have taken those classes for several years that become the leaders in those productions. So that's what we're looking to do with the, the theater classes is hopefully um, draw on that core group of students who are in a lot of the, the school productions so that they can um, take that class in just like for, for yearbook and newspaper Perhaps if a th the, the theater teacher is involved in our um, theater productions at the school, they can actually practice during the school day for their performances. So that, in essence, is what we're looking to change in the English department. Are there any questions? You know, Peg, you, you touched on a lot of good things, and I, and I just, towards the last one, the expansion of theater classes, which I think is great, but also on top yeah. of that, I think Studies show time after time that the vast majority of people are literally afraid to get up in front of somebody and say something mm -hmm. and talk. Right. And not that these folks or these students are going to be all actors or actresses, but just giving them the experience to get up in front of people is a fear that the vast majority of public has. You're right. And I just think that that, I think that's great under a lot of re for a lot of reasons right. and that being the most important not that they may go on to try to do that for a living but at least they have that experience and maybe you know there's a, a there's a lot to be said about that i mean how many people are held back in their careers for simply doing because that. they just have the fear of being in front of people. That. And we even have this conversation in my in our in, in English classes with students yeah. that they think about, now it's funny, like the results we talk about, like technology obviously has a lot of amazing results, but one thing that students even recognize now is since they communicate so much online, is they do feel, they recognize like the person to person um, you know, interaction and communication is, is st starting to be almost a lost art. So mm -hmm. I agree that I think that this is an important skill to continue to develop. Mm -hmm. Didn't we about a half a dozen years ago require speech as a ninth grade? What, we did. What and is that situation with that now? Is that the decision was made that that was no longer a graduation requirement. So you're right, every student did take speech in ninth grade, and then that was removed as a graduation requirement, which we still have a few sections, but obviously not nearly as many sections. 
um, as we did when it was a graduation requirement. But um, we even have more than just speech. We have sure. like a CHS argumentation mm -hmm. class. This is the next level of that. So, yeah. And by the way, I'm not suggesting that every student take that because some, right? You know, not everybody needs to get up in front of people. And there's, right. You know, but well, the point is, I actually think it's a really it, it was, right. was a good requirement because even when you think about the technology, how many times do you make a little video that you then post on YouTube or just in my work day, how many times do I have a Skype meeting or, you know, I work right. with people who are geographically yeah. scattered and you're still on, you know, you have to, to be comfortable enough with even looking at your device and sensing that there's a person on the other end of the device. Right. So, you, you know, I think it, it's a really great skill and I, I mean, I know we have a lot of things that we're trying to get into the curriculum, but I think whatever we could do to encourage our students to take more of the speech uh, classes would be a great thing. So I think it's good that you're expanding the, the opportunities, um, you know, through okay, the theater. So maybe a, a whole selection of courses could count toward right. that. Um, right. But just something to think about for the future. Okay, I agree. Thank, Thank you. you. Peggy, we have two more questions. Mike and then sure. Oh. So when we're talking about taking, uh, uh, removing some fiction selections and, and replacing them with nonfiction, are we, are we talking about s shorter selections, replacing longer selections, like m more some of the traditional longer nonfiction that you would read that you know a lot of us might remember here, remember reading uh, you know Chaucer and Shakespeare, and are we replacing that now with magazine articles and just shorter no, selections? No, we are still keeping a lot of the classic selections in there. Um, it's mostly supplementing those with, we can connect them to some nonfiction pieces. Um, so no, we're not looking to replace a whole lot of the classics, but just to supplement some of those with some nonfiction selections. Um, we did put, for example, we have like the last lecture is now by Randy okay. Pausch. Like we read selections of that as part of, a, of you know, our expanding nonfiction in 10th grade, which then we can connect to some themes in the literature that they read in that class as well. So that's, I think, the only longer nonfiction work that we've implemented. Everything else would be shorter works that we could just connect to other pieces of literature that we're teaching. Okay. Tom? Well, I'm probably going to show you my bias as, as well as <clears throat> what English was like when I taught it. But I, I, I guess my question is, um, what, what, at the secondary level, what do we expect or what are we forced to expect uh, with regards to grammar uh, <laughs> from the kids coming up? That is a very good question because when you go on the internet, yes, I realize what you see there is, is not what we're used to or what we expect. Um, and it's a, good, you know, it's a good question because speaking of all of the state assessments, and I, and I wish I could answer why this was done, there is now no writing test at the secondary level. Right. They just removed it. So in terms of what are our students accountable for, there's still, thank goodness, a writing section on the SAT that very much, and it's funny that they, they've even shifted the grammar and mechanics topics that are tested on the SAT, the writing portion of the SAT, which it's funny, of all things, punctuation is now tested more than it's ever been, which to me, and I guess to you too, that's, you know, a big deal. Um, so we still hold them very accountable. And as I said, even though Pennsylvania no longer has a writing test at the secondary level, we're still preparing them for college writing assignments. Um, we still do a lot of formal writing, but I know whenever you look and people write and post and tweet, it's not all proper <laughs> grammar, but that's, that's not the writing assignments that we're doing. And again, thank goodness they still are held accountable to know the very basics of writing, at least on, on yeah, some of the Yeah, and that's my tests. concern, not, not so much from the, from the testing point of it, although right. that, that is important, but one of the elements I, I believe that, that uh, account for the fact that many students cannot, <laughs> what I would say, re, uh, speak or write correctly, mm -hmm. in, by my definition, is because, uh, among other things, the expectation is not there, but a lot of the electronic devices are all forgiving. So, you know, when, when you get on and you, you do tweets mm -hmm. uh, at any level, 
uh, or you do any, anything like that where you're limited in terms of what you can write, then you're going to look for these shortcuts. Right. And kids start to think that these shortcuts are acceptable. Well, they are acceptable to right. them, but it, it, it's not necessarily correct. Exactly, and they also can rely on, well, there is spell check, but spell check is not foolproof. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's a lesson in and of itself. So what do we do as, as, as an English department then? We continue to write all the time. We continue to Thank make you. them revise all the time. I right. mean, I, I sure. really spend a lot of time reading student work, and if I'm going to put that much time into it, then they are going to revise and they're going nice. to chart all of their grammar errors and mechanics yeah. errors and yeah. have Thank lessons you. based on that. So, and, and I am a big uh, advocate of uh, nonfiction, contemporary nonfiction. Mm -hmm. So you're on the right track as far as I'm okay. concerned. Mm -hmm. All right, that's what we're hoping. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you, Peggy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you're you. welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. You writing your biography? <laughs> 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 Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Hi, Amy. Hi. I'm Amy Patsalevis. Thanks for having me to present for the Business, Computer, and Information Technology Department. Like Peggy, I'm also a mom of three children at McIntyre Elementary as well. So thank you for everything that you all do for them. The Business Department just finished their needs assessment last year. We presented to Curriculum Council this year. Um, with some of our findings from that, that uh, needs assessment and some of our wishes uh, that came about with the curriculum cycle. What we found through our needs assessment process is we are offering an expansive list of courses uh, to our students at North Hills that are aligned with the PA state standards. And those classes are very well received by the community and by the students at large. The technology has been updated in the uh, BCIT classrooms in both the middle school and the high school, so that supports what they're doing in their, in their courses. Uh, the Community Needs Assessment Survey and the Advisory Council feedback did indicate that students um, should be required to take either a career and personal planning course or a personal finance course before graduation. And I have to be honest with you, last night at curriculum night, my table was sectioned right next to the business department, and those by far are the two most popular classes that parents <laughs> really want to know about um, when they bring their students up to schedule for next year. Currently in the middle school, all seventh graders take an introduction to computers class. Um, the business department does not have a requirement as far as the eighth graders go. But if you look in that right-hand column, I think that Mike Polano and Kelly Kanith are doing a really nice job of offering a very expansive list of electives to our students. Um, and I won't take the time to read those all to you now, but you know those classes are well attended by students and the kids really, they, they learn a lot from Mike and Kelly um, in those classes and many of them take almost all of those classes through their high school career. So that's really encouraging. Um, a couple of changes to the, the business curriculum for next year. Kelly Kanith teaches a class called Microsoft Applications. We just put an articulation agreement into play with LaRoche College, where students who take that class will now be offered a CHS Microsoft Applications course. So that course will remain open for 9th through 12th grade. Only students, however, in 10th through 12th grade will be able to purchase those credits. Um, and also, Mike Polano will be teaching, excuse me, a gaming and entertain or a, um, a new course next year, game design, game production and marketing. I believe that it's called. It's on the next slide. That class, yeah, game production and marketing course. That's going to be offered as part of the Zulama program that we offer in conjunction with um, the Technology Education Department, and it's offered through Carnegie Mellon University. We really feel like that would be a great class as we start to look over our academies that we offer the high school students at North Hills. A gaming and entertainment academy um, would be awesome, and that class would fit really well with it. So just to speak a little bit about the, um, the game production and marketing course, right now students can enter that program, that Zulama program, uh, with three different venues. You can see that there's three options there, and they would all end at the end with the game production and marketing course, either as an 11th or 12th grader, to kind of complete that cohort or complete that program. Ruben Clark, the technology education teacher, he's responsible for teaching those other courses that are highlighted for you in green, and then Mike Polano would be teaching the game production and marketing course, um, like I had mentioned. That was short and sweet and to the point. Oh, Do you guys have any questions for me? <laughs> you drew the short straw, I guess. You know what? Asked. Yeah, they, the Gee, business really. department, they're clear and concise. They're easy to work with. That's great. Do you have any great, questions Amy. about the new programs? I do. You 
if you go back a slide, you had a new tech ed course as well. Um, <coughs> there's two new courses that you're proposing? I, I'm not in charge of the technology education okay. department, but there is a new tech ed class. Um, okay. I could let Jeff speak to that maybe a little okay. bit more. But that is a second new class. That would be a, another okay. new class. It's coming in a different department. Sure. Okay. Through tech, yeah, it was approved through Curriculum Council when we okay. met in December. But that was necessary, I guess, to continue on the mobile game design um, path. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you I, so much. Oh. I, I would just say, say and, and uh, I, I, Pat and I have spoken about this, and, and, and Dr. Taylor as well, about, about and he'll be talk, just tease up Jeff uh, coming up to talk about uh, uh, computer and technology education in, in the elementary. There's a real need for us to uh, improve and, and strengthen our K-12 K to 12, uh, yeah. computer uh, education. Um, as we saw on, on the slide that, that showed what, what, what's offered in the middle school, it's, it's not sufficient to what the demands are for in, in today's economy, that that intro to computers course is, is, is not the strongest course, and we need to, we need to strengthen our, our efforts, uh, uh, not, not just in the seventh grade. We're doing a lot of great stuff in the high school, but uh, we, we really need, need to strengthen it uh, K to 12 uh, to prepare kids for the, the world that we're, we're living in, and, and the, the changes are only going to come quicker. So, thank you. We're happy to help with yeah. any 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 feedback you can bring to us. Let's work together. That would be great. Great thank presentation, you. Amy. Thank, thank you. you so much. Ed, sure. Ed, I have one question. Oh, I'm sorry, Amy. May I have a question here? What percentage of the student body takes the personal finance? Oh, you know what? I could get that information and get back to you. I don't know offhand. Um, I do know personal finance and career and personal planning are probably the two most popular classes yeah, that Mike great, and, and Kelly do teach. Yeah, my son is enrolled in career and personal planning for next year. I highly recommend it. All three of my children will take that class when they get to the high school. Kelly does a great job. Uh, with that class when we had the graduation project requirement years ago and there were about 10 courses that were outlined it's a class that students would have to take before they could graduate yeah. both personal finance and career and personal planning were options for that so I might recommend some board members take that too dr yeah. taylor could you get that number for me please <laughs> sure. i believe it's about 50 students i believe but i'll double check thank you and thanks again amy all right thank you have a great evening thanks for coming And uh, I will get to conclude with talking about K-6 to computer literacy. So what we've had over the last several years is a very technology-rich environment at the elementary schools, but the way in which the computer literacy has been delivered has been a little fragmented. Um, we've had some buildings that kind of focus on certain applications and, and some online resources. So what I've heard from the secondary teachers are, you know, if students come from McIntyre, they might understand PowerPoint really well. But if they come from Ross, they understand Google Slides better, but not so much PowerPoint. So what I was trying to do is work with some teachers this year and look at kind of having a more formalized approach to computer literacy at the elementary level. So we've been piloting this year uh, computer literacy at, Mac at McIntyre in grades five and six. They had keyboarding and also in primary and intermediate grades. So what the idea is, is right now we teach formalized keyboarding in seventh grade, which all the research tells you it needs pushed down the elementary level. So um, we're actually looking at, we're piloting a program right now, it's called, we have the uh, handwriting program, which is called Handwriting Without Tears. We're looking at keyboarding without tears, that which will start in kindergarten. And they do a little bit each year from K to four. And by the time they get to fifth grade, they'll be proficient in keyboarding. And then what we want them to do is learn about skills and word processing and spreadsheets and presentations and digital citizenship. And then by the time they get to sixth grade, um, they will actually have computer programming or coding actually as a formalized part of their instruction, which then will allow us to then change that seventh grade introduction to computers class into something more that's uh, along with computer science. And then we get just keep moving all the way up to 12th grade and obviously advancing that computer science program. So what I'm asking for is to have a more formalized scope and sequence for K to six for computer literacy so that no matter what elementary building, or what grade level they're in, they're gonna get the same skills and objectives in the curriculum. Are there any questions? Push this forward hard. Okay, I'll do that. Anybody else? Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. You know, I just have one comment, which not often that we talk about I mean, we talk about so many things. It all impacts the district, but we never, this is kind of good because we don't get too much of this. 
next level, to know what's going on. And that's great. And I also well, think it's um, great to be uh, constantly educated mm -hmm. uh, as to what our curriculum council does. Absolutely. This has been going on for years, and, and it's very, it has been very well thought out and very well uh, executed. Well done. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, Arlene, I think you have a few more. From yes, I do. Um, the uh, number two is the razor crazy cart donation. And I don't have anything on that. Does anybody else? I well, have my computer. I know this, it's a, a, what, it's a, like a $350 donation. I mean, I, I can't pull anything up. Ah. That's why I was. It, it's actually for sixth grade. In the body. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's right there. The there's, the no there's no attachment. There's no attachment. There's no attachment. All right. Yeah. So what is so it all, then? Uh, it's all in the body here. Yeah. It's all in the bottom. Yeah, right there. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> it just came up. All right. Does anybody have any questions about that since I finally Actually, found it? Actually, that came from a community <laughs> member, too, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> it's an anonymous, it's an anonymous community, community member, yeah, which is great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. Let me get myself back in uh, whatever. Okay, the um, third item, excuse me, on in education uh, is the Project Lead the Way Agreement, and that is in conjunction with LaRoche, right? No. Does anybody have any questions concerning yeah. that? No. The last is the Transportation Plan and the Memorandum of Understanding between North Hill School District and DHS. Any questions on this? Uh, there being no questions, uh, I move that items one through four under education be added to the legislative meeting agenda for approval. <coughs> and we have a second by uh, Dr. Norwich. <coughs> thank you. Thank you, Arlene. And that's all, thank you. Okay. Let's move on to athletics and activities. Mr. Muha. We have one item on the agenda tonight uh, that the board approved the North Hills Wind Ensemble to play at the 2017 National Association for Music Education's All East Convention. This is uh, April 5th through April 7th, 2017. Students will miss two days of school, and it's, uh, I forget the city, it's in New Jersey. Okay. Um, so are there any other questions on that? This is a huge honor. They yeah, it is. Two years ago, yeah, in 2015, I, I, to Providence. I was going to say, it wasn't the, that's not yeah. the first time we're doing this. Two so. years ago, mm -hmm. Providence, and I had the honor of going with them. And it, it's just incredible to see our students perform and to see the reaction of music educators from across the country mm. when they see what our students can do. So going this, this is a wonderful opportunity. You going this year? Um, don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think this year's dates work for me, but it was okay. it was an incredible experience to go Great. as a board member and as a parent and just just to see uh, you know to, to see our kids perform on a national level like that. Thank you. Congratulations to them for mm -hmm. that that achievement again. Okay, then I, I move at item one under athletics and activities be added to the legislative meeting agenda. Second. Thank you. Then we could uh, there. We don't have anything on this on the agenda for Beatty, uh, Mrs. Bender, or Mr. Nudie. I don't know if you have anything to add uh, at this point. Nothing. Okay. No, All right. We can move on to personnel, Mr. Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Wilgus. Uh, personnel items are discussed in executive session, and therefore I'd like to move that items one through six be added to the personnel uh, be added to the legislative agenda meeting for approval. Second. Second. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Uh, Mrs. Reed, it appears we have nothing under policy this nothing evening. Nothing under policy. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Yeomans, you're on for community intergovernmental relations. Okay, so we have two items that we're actually going to take action on tonight. Um, so we have the nomination for a candidate to the AIU Board of Directors. And once again, Mr. Kelly has put forth uh, his <coughs> name uh, to represent uh, our district at the AIU. And uh, certainly grateful for his volunteer service uh, on behalf of the district. So I, I would entertain a motion uh, for Mr. Kelly to uh, once again be uh, a representative to the AI, AIU board. So moved. Okay. I thought right? you were the president. <clears throat> so how come you have to be, go to, if you're the president, how come we have to do this again? Aren't you on it already? You sound like a 
the current president. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to be elected. The officers of the IU are elected by the <coughs> IU board members. Oh, okay. So, so you have to go back onto the IU board. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Thank you. I just yeah. wanted to. It has nothing to do with him being impeached. He just has to go back. Okay. okay. All right. All right. So I got it. We have a now. motion just from Mrs. Nolan. Sorry, engineer. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we need, we, we need a second. We have a second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. <laughs> Congratulations, Mr. Kelly, for that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, we have a second item. Uh, we have a we have a resolution, uh, and I'm not going to read it. It's it's quite lengthy, but it's in our it's in it's in the packets. Uh, but it's it's a resolution opposing any legislative action that eliminates uh, school property taxes. Uh, you, you might be aware that uh, there is a, uh, for the second year in a row, uh, a movement in the state legislature to introduce a bill to eliminate school property taxes and replace them with uh, increases in the state personal income tax, <clears throat> excuse me, and the, the um, uh, as well as the state sales tax. Now, now uh, there's no one here that's going to stand up and say how much they enjoy paying property taxes. Uh, but the, to say that the, this, uh, what this uh, bill would do if it were successful, to say that it's, a, that it's an ex existential threat to the North Hills School District is not an over, overstatement. Um, the, the shift of these taxes would effectively send $14 billion back to the state legislature. That's money that the district would no longer control. Also, you, uh, we would be dependent upon the state legislature for our revenue allocation every year based on revenue sources and income tax and state sales tax that can fluctuate from year to year. Uh, and that, there's many problems with this bill, but another one is that um, they, they say that our money would be guaranteed for the first year, but after that, all bets are off. And... Uh, Essentially, you have 500 school districts across the state of Pennsylvania that have 500 different cost structures already built into them, largely based on personnel uh, contracts uh, that, that fluctuate wildly from district to district across the state. But then, basically, you would be getting a one-size-fits-all appropriation per student coming back from the state, uh, and, and based on where North Hills is in, in, in the hierarchy of, of, of cost per student, we could, we could wind up seeing a sig significant reduction in, in, our, in, in the revenues that come back to us from the state. Um, and uh, we've heard about all the wonderful programming uh, that we're able to provide our students uh, in this district. We heard about how wonderful our, our arts uh, and music programs are in our district uh, that are second to none in the state. And we heard about how we're expanding uh, some of those programs uh, in theater arts and in other areas. Well, you could just probably kiss a lot of those things goodbye if if uh, if these funding uh, the way the, the way our districts are funded is, is changed in such a radical and sudden manner. And if you don't mind, we also heard our uh, audit presentation that explained how we do our budget and our finance and where our our fund balances are. And I think you said something about with a seventy two million dollar budget that we have, and our expenditures matching what they are, that it is a reasonable budget that is presented in front of this board whenever we're asked to take those actions. So we take the property tax issue seriously when we look at our budgets and our finances and our expenditures and our revenues. And to send that much money to Harrisburg and think you're going to get it back is just not going to happen. And it is literally the death of public education, not just in the North Hill School District, but in the state of Pennsylvania. So um, I'm happy that you're entertaining this resolution as a board. I hope that other school boards around see to do something similar to this. It completely eliminates local control. And the ability for a district like North Hills to educate the students in Ross and Westview based upon what we believe is important. And you heard a lot of the things that we believe are important um, in the presentations tonight and in the points of pride earlier. We do a lot of fantastic things in this district, and as you said, something along these lines would kill this district. And we take this matter so seriously that uh, next month we, uh, we have canceled our, uh, uh, plan to cancel our legislative meeting uh, in order for all of the board uh, to attend the, uh, this, the meeting with the legislators at the AIU uh, uh, so that we can voice our opinion on this matter. I, can I just add something here? Uh, 
the, just the facts, the Property Tax Independent Act, it, it, it is very uh, insightful for me. But the fact that people, I don't think, realize that your federal tax will go up because if your property tax is eliminated, you can't deduct it from your federal tax. So therefore, again, you have a tax that's going up. Um, so I thought that was interesting, and I don't think we look at the whole picture, or are we even ever given the whole picture? That, that I think, is the problem. We never get the whole uh, story. Thank you. And, and one other point is that the, many districts, including ours, uh, receive a, a significant portion of their tax revenue from uh, uh, retail and industrial properties, and under this bill, uh, the, the, the burden that's uh, uh, carried by a lot of those companies, many of which are out of the state, uh, would would no longer uh, be carried by them and would be shifted back to, to to Pennsylvania taxpayers. You know, the thing about this too uh, is, and I, the way this is being introduced and and basically being sold to the public is, we're trying to eliminate property taxes. Period. They don't give the details what takes its place and how schools will mm -hmm. uh, operate uh, I can only we can all only go and perhaps do some research and see what's happened to the schools in the state of Michigan they did this in Michigan and those 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 schools are literally in shambles yeah. mm -hmm. I mean they're in, I mean, they've got problems but and I don't mean to spring this on you but I'm just wondering if this would make any sense when we have our facts and Dave I know you have uh, uh, some of the things on this uh, on this bill but maybe it makes sense for us to try to hold if you know a town hall meeting to just give our constituents the facts on just what this means because as I said most people the first thing and only thing they hear is we're going to eliminate property taxes and that uh, I'm yeah. in but how what happens after that elimination is what we need to we need to get uh, at least the facts out to our constituents so it might make sense that I'm not asking you uh, like I said, I don't well we already have the pub when's our next public budget um, committee meeting mm, March 21st I believe March uh, so we might piggyback that with our budget meeting. That might make sense. I'm just yeah. saying it's, I think we have to start an educational process here so our, our constituents know exactly yeah. what the impact of something like yeah. this can be. Plus, we, we can also work with Amanda on getting the mm -hmm. word out. And, and by the way, this is so serious. This came within a razor's edge of passing last time. Mm -hmm. So this is not something that somebody's just sitting there dreaming up in the legislature and they have four or five votes. They've got a lot of votes, so. Just the thought. Lou, you had a question? Uh, uh, my comment is that this flies in the face of local governance. Sure does. We decide what quality of education we want uh, for our children. We decide uh, what revenues we want to raise, raise and how we raise them. So I, I would suggest you get on the phone, talk to our representatives, talk to the senators, call every senator that you can find in the phone book. Butler County, uh, uh, in the uh, south, southern uh, uh, portion of, the, of uh, Allegheny County, get on the line with every senator and, and express your views, even though you're not a constituent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Good point. Okay. <clears throat> so with that, I would take a motion that uh, we we adopt the the resolution. So moved. Are there, is there any other discussion? All in favor. Aye. Aye. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Tom, Tom gave a second. It's an oh, did you say? Yeah. Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. <coughs> Is there anybody opposed? <coughs> okay, motion carries. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Michael. We're going to move on to finance uh, and Dr. Knowledge, but before we do that, I'm going to address item number one, if I could. Oh, okay. Or, or, or would you prefer I to was, do it? Well, I'll, would you, I'll start up and then Please feel free. Okay, I'm sorry. In. I didn't mean to take uh, Yeah, I, was, I just wanted to kind of give you the context for, for why this is back on here. Um, and please jump in if I'm leaving anything out. Okay. But as I understand it, when we um, talked about this at the last meeting, um, it really had two parts. We were setting the collector fee but for both Westview and Ross, mm -hmm. and we had um, a lot of good detailed information on Westview's um, costs, and so we set that payment, and I think my sense was that no one had any questions about the Westview payment. Um, so the, the, uh, the Ross fee, however, brought up a lot of questions that we didn't all have all the answers to, but at the time, I believed, and I think most of us believed that we had to take a vote last time that it had to be done before February 1st. So even though 
there was a sense on the board that we didn't have all the complete information, we took the vote based on the information that we did have at that time. And since then, I think some new information has come forward about what the Ross Township's uh, you know, services and costs actually are, and there's been more discussion about that. So I think maybe that's where you wanted to yep. maybe share some more information about that. So that's why what's coming back on is to look at the portion that deals with the fee for Ross yep. Township. Exactly. Um, mm -hmm. So that we can make sure we, we did find out that we do have a little more time. We can still take action on this tonight. Mm -hmm. So it seemed to make a lot of sense to um, look at it again and to see you know, what the additional information yeah. is telling us so that we can make the best decision we can for this. And my, my thought about this was, and I, I, we all voted, as I did, and, and I, I understand, and that, I, don't, I didn't have a problem may, maybe with the vote that we took, other than the fact that I just thought when, it, when a tax collector <coughs> takes the job, at least from my perspective, they understand what the fee is. And in the middle of the term, I, I just thought, it, I don't know if it makes real sense to change that fee. You might want to change it for the new tax collector or when they're up that's for election. Well, I think that's or you at least doing. bring it up for a vote, right? And I, I don't have a problem with that. But at least while that person is holding the office, uh, I, I just don't think it's a good idea to change that because I've, people do run for this office with certain expectations on what they will be collecting, and et cetera. So that, that's just me. It has nothing to do with... The, the actual mon itself. So, uh, so I think we do need a motion well, on that. Yeah. I'm I, sorry. I'd go like ahead, to ask then, please. Then, then, how did we come up with the figure last time? And uh, you know, we're we're setting this for four years again. Mm -hmm. So, well, if this comes up again four years from now, right. it'll be in the middle of a term again. Well, we. I mean. It, well, I it's setting it's, it for the new term. Setting it for the new term. This though. is for this the is new setting for the new term. Yes. Right, okay. and that was where the confusion was between February 1st and February 15th because we initially thought we had to make the decision before February 1st right. before um, potential taxpayer tax collector candidates would file, but we then found out that we had until February 15th. And oh, this okay. fee is still in effect for this year. This fee but would start this amount this year. Not start with the new terms. Is, right. Or am I reading that? Mr. Hall, is this is the fee we're voting on? Starts the fee you're voting on will, will be for whoever elected? gets elected this fall. Okay, okay. so the, the election this is this year then. Right. It is. Not, yeah, this okay. is 2000. So this is starting for, this <coughs> it is doing what you asked, Ben. The, mm -hmm. This fee, this fee starts new, in 2018. Yeah. The new term okay. of whoever the tax collector would, whether it be a re-election or a new And we did not reduce okay. it for the current tax collector who's in there now, right? There's no reduction. <laughs> Unless, of course, he gets reelected. I understand. I understand. Okay. Correct. Okay. But then we're not setting it. We're not resetting it midterm. No. I mean, we said we were setting it mid, resetting it midterm, but we're not. So, so again, how do we come up with the number before that that we voted on, and then that that's my concern that we. Well, I think we we used per. The cost per bills of per collective per per bill was that correct, Dave? We, the cost per bill. If you apparently look at my memo from the last time, we started right. with the fact that the correct tax collector subcontracts the service out right to Jordan Tax Service right for twenty four thousand something sure. or another. Mm -hmm. uh, we allowed him a certain amount of profit on top of that. <coughs> right. Okay, I do I do have a question relative to this. Okay, we do have another election coming up. Uh, suppose the new tax collector wants to go back to the way it was done rather than subcontracting yeah, it. Yeah, that's the point of it. Right. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it, if in fact that was part of our rationale for lowering it, um, I mean, I know we loved when the tax collector was up in Ross. Are they ever going to be allowed to come back? <laughs> John. Yeah, sure. So I, I'm yeah. not allowed. I mean, I, I don't know what took place relative to this mm -hmm. whole thing changing, but mm -hmm. I think that's something else we have to think about. Well, one of the pieces of information that I wasn't aware of was that that um, I believe that because there was not a tax office at the municipal building, that there was not a place for people to go to but to talk to the tax collector. But I've since, you know, been informed that they are they he does hold hours at other locations right. and other places in, within the township. I believe there's a business that he sets up shop. And so he does go out and make himself available to taxpayers. And that was part of the rationale, as I understood it, for cutting a fee because we were no longer providing that service. Mm -hmm. But so to me, that does raise a question. Well, if 
we cut the fee because the service wasn't be pro being provided, but then we learned that the service is being provided. But then, is it as know, consistent? I mean, I, I have yeah, no see, that idea. I still, I don't it is have not, Arlene. No, it is not, of, but it's, know, he's again, still available. Okay. There's still a lot of questions out there, so that's right. why I thought it was important for us to discuss this yep. and, yeah. and see what, what people, <clears throat> you know, maybe other folks have more information. Do you have any light to shed on this for Ross um, Township? Commissioner? <laughs> not to put you on the spot, but. I don't think I'd does. like to say no. something. Please, okay. I also know that our tax collector um, is available on weekends mm -hmm. during the um, tax season, which was normally not done okay. when it was done okay. at the municipal building. Mm -hmm. And also, he makes home calls. Hmm. He goes to the elderly's homes that cannot get out and get to the tax office or doesn't understand what they're doing, and he goes to their home. Mm -hmm. So he's definitely doing a job. Okay. <coughs> okay. And this, well, yeah, that's this a different level of service than just that's sure. a lot of level yeah. being subcontracted yes. out, which is what we okay what we thought it was, what we were talking about last time. Okay. So that's that's why it's out here for people to think about to think about this. And this is also the same fee being paid for 2017, right? For this year. No, this is that's different. the same fee that's been paid for the last okay. eight years. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So it's flat. We're keep, we you got it. This would be keeping it flat. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So, so we do need a motion so for I that, guess, right? So I guess the new motion would be, do we want, you know, in light of the other conversation and the other information, do we want to just keep Ross's fee flat? And that would be the motion that's that we that's have in front of in us. In front of us, yeah. Uh, I mean, if you don't want to make a motion, oh, I'll, I can you, I okay. can make the motion. Would, I'll go ahead and make great. the motion. That'd be fine. Okay. Um, All right. Is there, yeah. is there a second on that? Second. Thank you. Any other further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? I oppose. You oppose? Yes, no. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Spade, you're opposing setting what? the fee to this proposed fee? Right. The th uh, th what is it? 36500 36, seven, oh, It's 750 yeah, uh, yeah, thirty-six seven fifty. I believe it should still be what it was before. I, okay. Well, that is what it I was. It, is. That's that's what it was thirty-seven fifty. No, it was, it was always thirty-six seven fifty. No, that's what I'm saying. Dear, isn't it been Last there? meeting oh. we lowered it to thirty thousand. Yeah, right. Right, but this prior to, that, to raise it back up to the thirty-six seven fifty. He wasn't making thirty-seven fifty no. uh, five hundred. Thirty-seven and I don't think so. I, I think believe. we should look at that. Oh, well, uh, honestly, I was on the impression it didn't change. So just yeah, so, yeah. So he was, was, was making okay. thirty-seven fifty. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, Mr. Hall, if we move on, well, let's see. If we move, okay. So now we've raised the question again. Yes. It seems like the intention of the board is to keep it flat. Mm -hmm. I don't want to. Is that just to keep it where it was? To keep right. it where it yeah. was. Mm -hmm. I, I thought that was the motion. Right. To is make that, no change. Is that the motion? I, that's the well, motion. That's the I motion. You I don't know that that we can. I get, I'm, we're not sure if the thirty-six seven fifty we. I'm, I'm going to assume that's what it was. Just a second. But if it was 3750. David, David. Well, just a second. Yeah, David will have that. It's 750 dollars less. Okay. How about if we revise 30, the motion? It's currently 37650. Oh, maybe it was a oh, transposition well of this, numbers. Is this a typo then? Because if this we're going to keep like it flat, we should yeah. keep okay. it flat. Make a motion to keep the same. Yeah. Okay, how about, if I, yes. how about if I revise Let's the motion? Let's revise the motion, please. <laughs> there you go. Let, me, let me make a motion that we're going to keep the Ross Township real estate tax collector's fee flat, the same as it has been right. for the past Through 2021. Through 2021. Okay. Do we have a second on that? Second. Okay. You're sure? I'm sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Dee, for pointing that out. Okay. Thank All right, you. and that's why we're in such good financial yeah. shape, because right. we do pay attention to the that's tenants right. here. Okay. <laughs> so, All right, I'm glad we were able to get this sorted out. So. Yeah, sorry about that. Thank you. So. Okay, let's move on. We've got some other finance items. We've got general fund bills. We've got capital project fund bills. Aye, aye, aye. We've got budget transfers. We have payroll for the month of January 2017. We have a bid award for uh, copy paper that uh, they are the low bidder. I just lost it here. Um, and there's the there's results of bids if we want to take a look at those. 
the audited financial statements, which uh, the, we heard at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, so we want to add, my motion would be that we add, oh, and one more, re mm -hmm. re resolution 2017-4, which is creating a tax abatement under the Local Economic Revitalization Tax Assistance Act, otherwise known as LERTA. Mm -hmm. And this would be to approve a LERTA at the block at Northway. And what that does is it helps uh, improve the property, which we know is, has been a process that's been ongoing, and it's, it's uh, you know, looking in right. much, much better shape than it has been. I just want to add, I don't mean to interrupt, it's, yep. but what we're, what we're going to propose, Jeff Mills will be here, the attorney, next meeting to okay. make a presentation uh, before we vote on that. And it's uh, we're, we are actually mirroring what the township has done on their end for this we're doing the same thing that they've okay. done. For some that was going to be. But we will answer. discuss that right. further when that comes up for vote right. and after his presentation. Okay. So this would be <clears throat> this would be continuing our partnership with the township. Exactly. To mm -hmm. um, support that redevelopment out there. Well, but the but the purpose of of this action this evening should be to move this to the, to agenda. the voting to the agenda. session. Right. right. That's exactly so right. And that's we're what we're placing, doing. We're not mm -hmm. voting on it right now. Right. We're just right. placing <coughs> all these things yeah. on the agenda for the next so that we can legislative vote on meeting. It next time. <coughs> mm -hmm. I, give a, I have a question on that. Please. Dave, what will we be netting in tax? Can you give a rough idea if we use the LERTA? Uh, if I'm not mistaken, on the first couple of years, uh, they get 100%. First year is 100%. Second year is 90%. <coughs> now, is that on the increment of the... Uh, that, that's on the entire value of that parcel. It doesn't count the, 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 the appraised mall. value or assessed value of the property. It's for the entire amount of the property value. The, the entire amount. Can't. But it's, uh, <laughs> Lou, I just want to make sure it's... That it's clear. So this is not a. This is not the mall property. This is no. the, the parcel behind the mall right. where the Northway yeah, School. Right. Was. Okay. I'm sorry. I didn't know if you knew. So, okay. So it's so it's just where the Northway School it, was and and part of the parking lot of the original mall. Right. Pardon, Dave. Will you, I can't hear you. It's where the Northway School was. Yes, I'm, I'm familiar with the And part of the parking lot from the original mall. So. Okay. So we. But are, now will the LERTA apply to the basically the value added to that property or is the LERTA will amount, apply to the, the base value current the, base value plus the additional increment pardon me it will apply to the base value and the increment and the improvement mm -hmm. okay so we get nothing for the first i believe it's nothing the first year and then the right. second year 90 okay. percent and then it's phased in over the it's next phased in over a 10 years, year period 10 i believe years. 10 years yeah 10 it's 10 20 years I think that's the TIF. Now, I believe the t the alert, yeah. I believe, is 10 yeah. years. The TIF was 20 years. Right. Yeah, right now, there's, there's nothing on that property, if I, that portion, portion of the property. Exactly correct? right. So we're getting nothing of nothing right that's now. Right. No, 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 that's no, no. no. Currently, we are getting taxes on that it's portion. It's value of the land, right. 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 But as opposed to but the eventually. potential of what right. they could do if we develop it. Correct. Right. Okay. Well, well, we'll have, I'm sure we have a lot of questions on that, but. And we will, after we'll his presentation, sure. We'll well, get just, answers on just, that next week. Let's keep in mind that we're it's talking ten years, it's ten years. That we're talking about Alerta for something we don't know anything about other than a couple of pictures that we're seeing. And next week we're supposed to get so so it seems to me we got this in reverse here. We should be having the discussion first and the presentations first and then decide if we even want to do Alerta which is what I brought up whenever we were talking about the tip. I said keep in mind that the Alerta that the, when we vote for the TIF, we're not necessarily no, voting no, for the no, alert. No, right. So. But does is it, is there, school? well, I definitely think we need the presentation. I mean, yeah, could, we, then, could yeah. we retain the option oh, sure, to delay yeah. the vote? Yeah. If we I, feel I don't like think, think that'll be necessary. I'm hoping that after the presentation, everybody will have a clear understanding. Okay. But yeah, but we're going to wait before the, we're going to wait for the presentation, presentation first. Absolutely. Then. Okay, so what we put it, it on the agenda, we get the presentation, there but we're go. not necessarily committing to take a vote. No, but we're going to, we're going to put it on as a vote, but we'll see how it goes. We can I have a question. Please. Okay. So when does the clock start running? The the moment we approve the LERDA, it's a year from that that we don't collect anything, or is it is it a year from when whatever is going to be built there is constructed? Is that when the clock starts? Well, let's see. I don't I don't know. Okay. Let's see. We're just looking at the agreement to see. Well, 
Well, it sounds like we've got a lot of questions to Absolutely. be Absolutely, and we'll get them all answered for so. sure. <clears throat> okay, well, with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, knowing that putting it on as a as an item, you know, with that clarification, mm -hmm. the alert on as an item is not necessarily binding us to a vote next week if we feel we need more information. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move that items three through nine under finance be added to the meeting agenda. Can I add something real quick before Please. you do? I am reading the the document right now. The resolution. And the alert is on the improvements. So if okay. I'm reading this correctly, it's on the improvements, not on the base. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. So, yeah. so we've, I, that I makes agree. the answer to the to the last question. We'll continue to collect what we are currently collecting. Okay. Yeah. The LERDA goes into effect when there are improvements. On right. the new whatever right. they would yeah. add to that property. Good answer. Okay. Thank you, David. <clears throat> okay. So you've made a motion. Made a motion. We to need go a ahead second. Ahead. Second. second. Thank you. Okay. Uh, all right. So we got our second. So let's move on to uh, looks like support services, Mrs. Spade. Um, we have an extension of Quest contract. Um, approval is requested to extend the contract with Quest from February 28th, two, 2017 to June 30th, 2017. Okay. Are there any questions regarding that? Okay. I move that item one under support services be added to the legislative meeting agenda. Second. Thank you. All right, thank you. And before we close the meeting, uh, we now can move on to additional public comments. Is there anybody from the public that would like to address the board? <laughs> sure. That's been taken off. Taken off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we, we took that off. We, we need further clarification as to Thank you. Oh, yes, sir. I'm, I'm sorry, you know what, I, I should have, but anyway, if you don't mind taking the podium and, and at, state your name and address, if you would, please. I guess we have to read this. You want to? Uh, no, we'll okay. We'll All right. okay, just name and address for the, for the record, please. Patrick Hodge, okay. H-O-D-G-E, 302 Wildflower, one word, okay. court. Thank you. Pittsburgh, PA, 15202. Thank you, Mr. Hodge. Thank you. Uh, my question is about uh, within the audit, the pension fund that we're discussing here, our pension fund for the district, is that considered a fully funded pension fund? To what percentage do we know that is funded? Mr. Hall can answer that, but I know we're, well. The pension fund being discussed in the audit is actually the Pennsylvania School, school Employees Retirement System Fund. It's a, a state fund. Yes, sir. I'm in SERS. I'm familiar with that. Okay. Yes, sir. PSERS is clearly not fully funded. Uh, I believe, as he was indicating, there is a $45 million or $45 billion, billion dollar deficit in that fund. And our share of that deficit is the $110 million that it's, is, he was stating is a liability on our books. Uh, correct. Thank you. And uh, real, real quick, two more here. Transportation plan and MOU between North Hill School District and DHS, Delta Hotel Sierra. That is the Department of Homeland Security? Uh, human Services. Okay. <laughs> We're not that important. <laughs> <laughs> not yet, right? <laughs> we will be. Uh, and finally, uh, where does Governor Wolf stand on this uh, resolution 2017-3? Uh, uh, we we don't know. Yeah, I mean, we're, you know, it's not the resolution he stands on, but the, right. the, the, the right. legislation that may push this taxing forward or lack of taxing. I, I want to, I, I, I hate to speak for him, but I think he is opposing the prop. I think, I really do, but I. Yeah, this is, would be my sense, but yeah, I just wondered I, if I, anybody I, had I heard him. Sure. Okay. He, he actually he proposed a watered like down version of it. Oh, he ap approves a watered down version, Dave? He, he proposed last year a oh, watered okay. down version okay, of so it. Okay, so I stand corrected. To, okay. uh, to, Reduce the, the property taxes somewhat. Okay. Well, and I, th I thank you. If thank I you for your question. If, if you, if you no. recall when he did run, he, he did run on a policy of, um, I don't think eliminating property taxes, but reducing them and replacing them with other taxes. So um, uh, to, to, yeah. to say he would support a watered down version, I think is pretty safe or yeah. pretty accurate. Okay. 
Thank you, Mr. Hodge. Okay. I will uh, adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Thank you.